So hello and welcome to this MPTO course entitled Trauma and Literature. We will start with a new text today which is uh, following the one we did last time, Salahasa Manto's Toba Tek Singh. Uh, this text is also by Manto, it's another short story, it's called Cold Meat or Thunder Ghost, uh, which is also about partition, also about the trauma of partition. Uh, from a very different perspective, the reason why I selected this story is because it talks about the trauma um, suffered by uh, the perpetrator of violence. I mean, in most occasions, we talk about trauma uh, suffered by the person receiving violence or the um, you know the sufferer of violence. But in this particular case, we see an experience of trauma which is affecting someone who actually perpetrated violence on someone else. In this case, it's sexual violence. Uh, this story is very graphic in content. It's uh, very explicit uh, in, in terms of sexuality. So I'm not going to read it line by line. But I'm just going to give you an overview of how <clears throat> this could be seen as a very interesting example of partition violence. Because, uh, you know, the whole idea of partition, obviously, uh, it was an act of violence, as we saw in the Toba text scene as well. Uh, violence not only level of uh, body or uh, sexuality or, uh, you know, the organic quality of violence, but also violence at a level of knowledge, at a level of uh, what you know about yourself, or what you know about places and the surroundings around you. Uh, in other words, violence which affects you at a level of embodiment. And embodiment, of course, uh, it takes into account not just the organic neural quality of the body, but also uh, the discursive prosthetic quality of the body in, in its engagement with the reality around it. Now, what the partition did is it completely and dramatically defamiliarized reality. Uh, you know, the, the whole idea of reality, the whole notion of reality, the whole experience of reality was suddenly and dramatically defamiliarized. And this dramatic defamiliarization of reality is what makes um, the stories of partition so uh, violent in quality. So this story, Thunder Ghost, uh, called Meat, uh, is about a person, uh, a Punjabi person, um, who comes back home, uh, wants to make love to his um, mistress or wife, we don't quite know. Uh, and the whole entire description is very sexual, explicit in quality. But then we realize, we, we are told in the story that he can't uh, consummate the sexual act. He suffers, he seems to suffer from some kind of a psychological problem. Uh, the, his wife or his mistress, uh, she's trying to engage him uh, sexually, but he can't consummate the act, he can't perform it. Uh, so there is that quality of performance anxiety. There is that, uh, you know, the whole idea of not being man enough. Uh, to carry out the sexual act and the woman uh, in the story gets very, very distraught and angry. Uh, and also we see the, the, the embodiment of the woman and the man are quite interesting over here. Uh, the woman is very assertive, the woman is very uh, almost violent in quality, very aggressive. Uh, and when she finds out that uh, he cannot uh, consummate the act, he cannot uh, sexually perform, uh, she gets very, very angry and she hits him with a, with a tiger, she stops him with a tiger which uh, almost kills him uh, and he starts bleeding. Uh, but then when he starts to bleed, when he starts to, uh, you know, when he's wounded by the tiger, he confesses what had happened, uh, what is the reason why he can't um, consummate his uh, sexual activity. And then we are told in the story that he, along with other Sikh men, and other Punjabi men, uh, they, they're going to attack, uh, presumably a Muslim neighborhood, uh, because that was the whole partition, um, violent uh, binary, the Hindus attacking Muslims, the Muslims attacking Hindus, the Sikhs attacking Muslims as well. Uh, and the obvious target of such violence was the female body. Uh, the female body becomes a very symbolic site where violence is perpetrated. It almost becomes a symbolic statement of violence. You know, the more you mutilate the female body, the more you aggressively uh, control the female body, the more um, it almost becomes a territory. Uh, it becomes an act of, uh, uh, shall we say, territorialization. So uh, this group of Punjabi men who had uh, so sort of ravaged uh, a Muslim neighborhood, uh, they gone inside a, a house and, and obviously looted and killed everyone. And then this particular person, uh, Isha Singh, who's uh, one of the characters in the story, uh, he picks up this woman um, who he thinks is very beautiful and he carries her um, you know, throughout and he uh, obviously with the intention of sexually violating her, attacking her sexually. And then he brings her to a particular corner and is about to attack her, molest her sexually, uh, when he finds out that she's already been dead, she's already killed. Uh, by the perpetrators. She is a dead woman and all the time he had been uh, caring and desiring a dead body. So uh, it sort of becomes uh, necrophilic in quality as well, in a very perverse way, in a very ironic way. Now, so the whole story is about 
Uh, the reason why it's called cold meat, uh, meat obviously is a body way, uh, it's the corporeal quality of the body, corporeality. Uh, cold is a dead quality of that body, so it's a dead body, it's dead meat, it's cops. Um, uh, meat obviously also means uh, a very, very sexualized uh, description of the female body. It's meat to the man, it's meat to the man perpetrating the violence. And that obviously becomes a pointer to the, uh, the perversity of violence during partition where women became just targets of violence, women became just bodies to be attacked, to be mutilated, to be sexually uh, you know, violated. Uh, because as I mentioned, uh, the whole idea of female sexuality uh, and attacking female sexuality uh, became part of the territorializing process during partition. So you attack the female body, you claim that body and you claim that particular identity as well. So, you know, the whole idea of protecting and attacking the woman became um, uh, a major discourse during partition, uh, a major act during partition. And there are other novels you can read. There's one novel I recommend very, very highly. It's a novel called What the Body Remembers. It's called What the Body Remembers by Shauna Singh Baldwin. Uh, so, you know, this story is a bit like that as well. So, it's about uh, the perversion of uh, violence, it's about aggression, it's about sexuality, it's about, uh, you, know, you know, unintentional necrophilia. But all of these connect to the idea of partition. So, what do we actually, what is actually being partitioned? It's not just about land masses, it's not just about identities, it's about humanity as well. You are being partitioned from your humanity, you are being partitioned from a normal, healthy psychological self. And this whole story, which is uh, actually about um, the unhealthy psychological self, uh, where you know, the, the, the mind becomes uh, completely gripped by the fear. Uh, paradoxically, the fear is produced by his own violence. And this is what I meant at the very beginning when I said uh, it's an interesting story because it's got a very, uh, shall we say, unusual take on trauma. We get the trauma of the perpetrator, not the trauma of the victim of violence, but the perpetrator of violence. He's the one suffering from trauma because he finds out uh, at the end that you know, he had been desiring a, a dead body. He had been desiring a dead woman all this time. And that affects him sexually, that affects him psychologically, so that affects him in terms of his uh, you know, sexual performances later on, as a result of which he can't perform his usual aggressive sexual self in front of his mistress or wife, we don't quite know. So that being the backdrop of the story, I'm going to read it in certain parts because as I mentioned, it's a very uh, graphic story and it's not really, uh, you know, it's not required to read it line by line. But this is the theoretical backdrop and, you know, and the reason why I've selected this because if we compare this to Toba Teik Singh, with Toba Teik Singh, uh, the violence is not so corporeal. The violence becomes more psychological. Uh, it's about mad men in, in uh, Salem and Lahore. It's about mad men who want to go back to their old, uh, old towns, old homes, which is unavailable to them. It becomes an unavailable option to them. Uh, so this unavailability of agency becomes a psychological problem. Uh, and of course, the story ends, as we have seen, uh, literally in a no man's land, literally and symbolically in a no man's land, that place between India and Pakistan, that place between uh, memory and forgetting, that place between classification and declassification. Right? Now, that is obviously a very psychologically complex story. But in this story, Thunder Ghost uh, or Cold Meat, the violence is more immediate, more visceral, more corporeal, more bodily. And that's why you know, the, the very title suggests that, the very title is indicative of that. Okay. So uh, we just read listen parts. So we look at the beginning of the story, which should be on your screen now. This is Tandar Ghost by Sada Hassan Manto, uh, obviously translated from Urdu into English. So here we begin. Soon as Isha Singh entered the room, the Kulwant car got out from the bed, uh, stared at him with her sharp eyes and locked the door. It was past midnight and a strange and mysterious quietness seemed to have gripped the entire city. So uh, what's important for us is to see the, the wordlessness of the beginning. Uh, the man comes in, uh, Kulwant's car, you know, the woman gets up from his bed, gets up and locks the room, locks the door. And we also told uh, the strange and mysterious quietness had gripped the entire city. So there is a quality of the uncanny, uh, which is created at the very beginning of the story. The uncanny being the unhomely, the unheim lake, right outside the home. Right, so this whole idea of being outside the home, outside of normalcy, outside of normal, normative territory, uh, that has become the norm during partition. So this is what happens in partition. Uh, partition becomes a norm, violence becomes a norm, uh, defamiliarization becomes a norm. So everything is defamiliarized. Uh, at a very psychological level, at a very um, epistemic level. Your, your knowledge of your reality, your knowledge of your surroundings is dramatically defamiliarized. So, uh, 
Kelvan Carl uh, sat on the bed, yoga style, and Isha Singh, who was probably uh, unraveling his thoughts, stood there with a dagger in his hand. So the dagger becomes a very symbolic weapon. The dagger obviously means that he had to you know, use it against someone. He probably killed someone with it, and he's brought it back home uh, with the dagger in his hand. Uh, so, in, in a very literal way, the violence enters the home through the dagger. So, dagger becomes the, the metonymy of violence during partition. That has been carried around everywhere and obviously, presumably, has been used to kill other people and now it's been brought back to the home. So, it becomes the metonymic marker of violence in a public space. A few moments pass in complete silence. So, again, uh, look at the wordlessness at the beginning. The silence at the beginning is important for us to understand. Annoyed with the silence, uh, Kowan Ko moved to the edge of the bed and started uh, dangling her legs. Isha Singh still didn't say anything. So, you know, it all becomes bodily gestures, bodily movements. Uh, there is a sexual tension building up over here. Uh, Kowan Ko uh, goes to the edge of the bed and starts dangling her legs, but you know, still Isha Singh didn't say anything. And then we give a description of uh, Kowan uh, you know, sexuality and his. Uh, uh, how assertive she is of the female body, etc. Now, uh, but the important thing over here is to see how Isha Singh, as a big burly man, is being emasculated by his own act of violence. So this is what we know. Uh, Isha Singh stood quietly in the corner. His hand that held the dagger was trembling. From his build, one could tell that he was a perfect man for a woman like Kulwan Kaur. So, in a normally, he's a very, very sexually active man. He's just like a big burly uh, Punjabi man, and he would have, you know. Normally, in normal circumstances, his sexual prowess and performance uh, are very, very uh, aggressive. Okay, but at this particular occasion, we are told that he's trembling uh, like a child. He's got his dagger in his hand, he's trembling. So, obviously, something had affected him psychologically, something had affected him at a very deep traumatic level. Okay, uh, and then the question is asked, uh, Kowan Ko, the woman asks him, Isha darling, uh, Kowan Ko shrieked. Uh, but immediately controlled the voice. Where were you all these days? I don't know. Isha Singh moved his tongue over his dry lips. What kind of answer is that? Asked Kalwan Ko angrily. Isha Singh dropped his dagger on the floor and lied in his bed. It seemed as if he had been ill for many days. Kalwan Ko looked at the bed uh, that was now filled with Isha Singh and felt sorry for him. Uh, what's the matter with you, darling? Covering uh, Isha Singh's forehead with a palm, Kalwan uh, Ko asked lovingly. Uh, so, you know, there's the beginning of some kind of a sexual tension and now we very quickly see that it becomes a foreplay with a man and woman, they enter into some kind of a sexual relationship and sexual activity uh, which gets interrupted all the time because it's something which has obviously psychologically affected the man, right? So, uh, I mean, the build-up of the story is so uh, craftily done. There is complete wordlessness, there is complete silence at the beginning which is so eloquent in quality. Uh, it's a silence after a storm, it's a silence after a big act, it's a post-act, a post-event silence. Uh, and that silence grips everyone on a very bodily, corporeal, visceral level, right, which affects the person psychologically, which affects the person's sexual activity at a very psychological and almost neurotic level, right? Okay. Right, so we, uh, and the whole description of the foreplay is given to us in very graphic details because one of the things which Manto is very good at, he foregrounds the body uh, very, very strongly in partition. And the sexualized body, the violated body, the body suffering violence, the body perpetrating violence. So all this body has become very important in Manto. So here we have uh, a male body and a female body uh, trying to establish uh, a sexual relationship in a very aggressive way. But despite the aggression, they cannot consume it. You know, then this lack of consummation is constant. Uh, interruption becomes important. And as I mentioned, if you remember uh, in the previous lecture as well, we talked about Tobatek saying as a regular example of interrupted identity. Uh, it's interrupted because it doesn't know how to go back. It doesn't know his contours. It doesn't know his location. It doesn't know his future. It doesn't know his past. So it becomes uh, uh, interrupted at a very spatial temporal level. It doesn't know which space it belongs to. It doesn't know which, sp which time it belongs to. So the spatial temporality of Toba texting is important because that becomes a marker of interruption where interruption gets played out. Now here too, interruption gets played out in a, in a more micro space, in a more intimate space. So here are the man and the woman trying to carry out uh, a sexual act and they're getting constantly interrupted because the man cannot consummate it, the man cannot perform it uh, because obviously something's bothering him at a very deep psychological level, right? Uh, <clears throat> and then we are told, um, uh, he loosened his grip, this should be on the screen, uh, he loosened his grip and fell next to Kalwan Ko panting. So Isha Singh cannot carry out the sexual act. 
Uh, his forehead was uh, sweating bullets. So again, look at the metaphor over here. So his uh, forehead was sweating bullets. So bullets were obviously, uh, almost as the bullets were entering his forehead, they were being fired at his forehead. Uh, Kowan Ka uh, tried very hard uh, you know, to make him carry out his act, but to no avail. Disappointed and infuriated, Kowan Ka got off the bed, picked the shadow, the, the, uh, uh, the, the garment hanging on the wall, on the nail of the wall, and wrapped himself, herself. Her nostrils expanded. She said furiously, Esha, darling, who was that bitch who spent all these days with, who has sucked you dry? So he, her obvious uh, 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 accusation, her obvious uh, suspicion is that he must have been with another woman who has uh, obviously, you know, uh, entered a sexual relationship with him as a result of which she cannot carry out this act. Now, the response over here becomes very ironic. Uh, so when he's asked, who is the woman that you are with, uh, you, who, you must have had a sexual relationship with him, as a result of which you cannot carry out uh, you know, this particular act. And the response of Isha Singh is interesting. No one, Kalwant, no one. Isha Singh sounded very, very tired, which becomes an ironically uh, correct answer because he was with no one, he was with nobody because he was with a dead woman. Right, so that nobody or the nothingness becomes the appropriate response to this question, uh, who were we with? Right, so this becomes interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, response, an interesting uh, uh, retaliation to this particular thing. Okay, and now we are told, um, you know, now we are told uh, the story that happened before. Uh, but before that, you know, uh, uh, this woman, um, uh, Kowan Ka became very, very, very you know, suspicious and very uh, jealous and very envious and very aggressive. So he hit her, she hit him with his dagger and the blood begins to fall out of his uh, body and almost he, he's got a death blow as it were. Uh, and the same dagger which he had used to uh, perpetrate violence to someone else and it comes back to him. Now, which is a very symbolic thing because uh, as we are told, uh, Kowan Ka went berserk. Uh, she picked up the dagger from the floor, removed his cover like a banana peel, uh, and stabbed Esha Singh in the neck. Blood gushed forth from, uh, from Esha Singh's neck. In a frenzy, Kalwan kept stabbing him and cursing the other woman. So it's almost like, you know, she's, um, it's like a proxy sexual act. Uh, she's hitting him with a dagger and she's cursing him as, it, as she's hitting him. Now this dagger becomes interesting because dagger becomes a metaphor for a very, very interesting condition. So the same instrument of violence which is used for someone else comes back to you, which is a very symbolic thing for the purpose of this story, which means that the trauma and the violence you want to perpetrate on someone else comes back to you. So you become a perpetrator as well as a sufferer of violence. So you suffer your own violence, you suffer your own, uh, you know, trauma in that sense. So that becomes interesting um, uh, activity over here, an interesting uh, dialogue, uh, a loop as it were, between the perpetration and the suffering of violence. So the sufferer is also the perpetrator, the perpetrator is also a sufferer. In other words, during partition, everyone is, trauma, uh, is tra traumatized. The perpetrator as well as the sufferer are equally traumatized during partition. So there is no victor, there is no you know, winner in the partition. Uh, the binary between the uh, creator of violence and the receiver of violence, between the perpetrator of violence and the consumer of violence is blurred. As a result, we see this very, very symbolically done. The same dagger which had been presumably used uh, to kill other people now comes back and kills them or hurts them, wounds them, gives them a dead blow. So we're told that, you know, that dagger is being used to stab his neck all the time and the blood gushes out of his uh, neck, you know, oozes out of his neck and he is suffering. Okay. So uh, uh, now comes the confession moment in the story. Blood was now reaching Esha Singh's mouth. He tasted it and his whole body shivered. Okay, um, and now we are told um, you know, uh, what happened, what's the back story. An eye, an eye killed six people with this same dagger. So this is a very, very metaphorical and symbolic statement. I who killed the other people with the same dagger, I'm now getting killed They're using the same dagger. So the dagger comes back. Okay, so now he confesses. So the uh, Kowan Ko keeps asking him, uh, who's the other woman who was obviously used to you sexually as a result of which you uh, cannot perform your sexual uh, act. And now the confession comes. I will tell you, Esha Singh's voice was breaking down. He touched his neck, felt the blood and smiled. Man is so weird. Get to the point, furious Kowan Ko was waiting for an answer. Esha Singh smiled again underneath his blood-filled moustache. I'm getting to the point, you've slipped my throat. So that's how to tell it very, very slowly. So there's almost like a black humor over here. 
a very dark humor. So he's like, you know, I'm trying to tell the story, but obviously you slipped my throat and I'm dying. So I have to be a bit slow. You have to forgive me for being slow because my uh, throat has been slit by yourself. Cold sweat ran down his forehead and I began to recount. Cut with my life. I kind of began to tell you what happened to me. When the riot broke out in the city, like everyone else, I also participated. I gave you the loot, but I did not tell you one thing. So uh, this becomes a very important description. Like everyone else, I also participated, which is to say there seems to be a contagious quality about this communal riot. It's like a contagion, it spreads. Uh, so everyone's looting everyone else. So I too participated in it. I looted, I gave the bounty of the loot, but I did not tell you one thing. There's one thing which is missing, one dark secret which I withheld from you. And now the time has come to tell you about it. Isha Singh groaned with pain. Kowa Singh had, Kowa and Kaur had no feelings for him and paid no attention to his suffering. What was it? Blowing on the blood clot coming from his moustache, uh, Isha Singh uh, said, the house attacked had seven people in it. I killed six of them uh, with the same dagger that you stabbed me with. So again, the dagger becomes an instrument, it becomes a metaphor of how the perpetrator and the sufferer become the same subject of violence, the same object of violence as it were. There was a beautiful girl in the house. I took her with me. Kovan Carl was listening intently. Uh, Isha Singh once more tried to blow the blood off his mustache. Kovan, darling, I cannot tell you what a beautiful girl she was. I would have killed her too, but I said to myself, Isha Singh, no, you enjoy Kovan Carl every day. Taste a different fruit. So again, this complete uh, commodification of the female body, this complete sexualization of the female body, the, the female body just becomes an object of sexuality, of male sexuality projected on it. Uh, so it's a very cool, crude description, uh, which is a very authentic description of partition as well, because exactly how it happened. The female body became a territory for men to perpetrate the violence uh, at a very, very ethnic level. And it's become a statement as well of territorialization. So as if you see the uh, description over here, the female body is just to be enjoyed, it's just a body. Uh, so you enjoy a common core every day, taste a different fruit. A complete crude commodification is at play over here. This is the psychology which has been displayed. Oh, was the only word out of Kowan Singh's uh, mouth. I put her on my shoulder and got out. On the way, what was it saying? Oh yes, on the way, near the river. I lay her down by the bushes. First I thought I'd deal the cards, but then I decided not to... Uh, uh, Isha Singh's throat was completely dry. So dealing the cards becomes a metaphor of foreplay. So I thought I'll deal the cards, but then I decided I should go with the, uh, the do the act or violate her sexually right away. Then what happened? Got Kowan Ka. I threw the trump card, which always is a metaphor of violating her. I, I just went for violating her. Uh, I attacked her sexually. I threw the trump card, but, but Isha Singh's voice was now a mere whisper. Then what happened? Kowan Ka shook him. Isha Singh opened his tired and sleepy eyes. I looked at Kowan Ka, whose whole body was trembling. She was dead, Kowan. It was a dead body, a cool flesh. Please hold my hand. Kowan Ka put a hand over his. His hand was cooler than ice. So obviously, this is also a symbol of death. You know, he probably dies in the end. His hand was colder than ice. Uh, so he becomes dead. He becomes expressionless. He becomes feelingless. He becomes you know, emotionless entirely. Now, what uh, we need we need to unpack this very seriously. So you know he had been carrying a dead body on his shoulder, with the intention of violating her, with the intention of sexually attacking her. Uh, when you find so later that it was a dead body and was desiring a dead body and realizes he was being a, a necrophilic all the time, that grips him, that paralyzes him, that paralyzes his sexuality, his cognitive ability, and he becomes cold, he becomes frozen, he, he freezes in fear. Now uh, that frozenness. Uh, is brought back home, that frozenness uh, comes back home, that frozenness grips them uh, cognitively, experientially, psychologically, and also you know, at a very corporeal level. He cannot carry out his corporeal activities, he cannot carry out his sexual activities, he cannot get warm again, as it were. So the whole act uh, of sexuality, the whole act of sexual violence, uh, is sort of, uh, hits him back, it's directed back at him. Right? So when he confesses that he was trying to you know, mutilate or decimate or attack, uh, a female body because everyone was doing that. It was part of the whole program of violence uh, during partition that you attack a female body, you commodify it, you, you, you just project your male aggression on it. Uh, it becomes a landmass, it becomes a territory, it becomes something to be owned and claimed with violence uh, and commodification. So that was done and he carried the body. He killed six people prior to that with the same dagger. Uh, and then, you know, he carried the body and, and went, went in a corner with the purpose of obviously violating her. 
and then realize when he's about to attack her section that she's already dead, that she had a death for us. She was carrying a cold dead body on her shoulder, a corpse on her shoulder. Now this corpse becomes interesting because the corpse, among other things, can also be seen as the dead human. Uh, the dead human in partition, the human is dead in partition, so all you have are corpses, everyone is a corpse in the partition, no one is really living, uh, it's like a zombie-like existence, everyone is bereft of uh, humanity, empathy, imagination, warmth, uh, everything disappears, everything becomes uh, a cold meat. So the entire partition becomes the um, production of cold meat. Uh, cold meat is produced, cold meat is consumed, cold meat is um, the paralysis of cold meat is what has been produced. So uh, among other things, the partition could also be seen as production of paralysis, right? The whole paralysis which grips everyone and numbs everyone becomes a norm in partition. This numbness, this, this feelinglessness, this coolness, bereft of humanity, bereft of warmth, bereft of imagination, bereft of empathy, uh, bereft of uh, normal human connect becomes the symbol of AS. So the cold meat, the cold dead body, the cold corpse uh, becomes the human body in partition. Uh, interestingly, it is the body of the attacker as well as the body of the sufferer, the body of the perpetrator as well as the body of the receiver of violence, right? So this becomes a very, very complex condition of violence in partition. So as a result, you know, you can see in the beginning, as I told, uh, trauma over here becomes a visceral experience, becomes a corporeal experience. He's traumatized uh, to such an extent that he cannot carry out his functions. He becomes a dead man. Uh, so the cold meat which traumatizes him, uh, which shivers him, which makes him shiver, which engulfs him entirely, uh, also becomes him. He becomes cold meat as well. And person who listens to the story, call one saying, uh, call one call, she becomes cold as well, everyone becomes cold. So cold becomes contagious over here. This coldness, this, this corpse-like cold corporate reality is pressing a contagion everywhere and engulfs the partition, engulfs the population of partition over here thoroughly. So this becomes uh, a trauma narrative, a trauma experience where the perpetrator and the sufferer are equally engulfed, equally consumed by partition. So there is a cannibalistic quality about uh, the story where you're eating cold meat, you're desiring cold meat, and then in the process you're becoming cold meat. So you become what you attack, uh, you become what you uh, violate. Uh, so your act of violence comes back to you, your act of violence violates you as well. Your perpetration of violence is directed back at you. So the whole idea of partition as an act of perpetration, as an act of suffering, as an act of consumption, as an act of cannibalization and commodification, all of this is unpacked or packed in the story using this metaphor of cold meat. Uh, so aggression, attacking, uh, violence, they all become an uh, example of paralysis, they all become the production of paralysis, which uh, attacks back the, uh, you know, the actor as well, the perpetrator as well. So trauma in this particular story becomes uh, a distributive category. It's not a binary. It's not as if the person creating trauma and the person suffering trauma are different people. They're the same people, right? The people, people that died in trauma, people that died in violence uh, are actually, you know, in some sense, in some perverse sense, luckier than these people who have to live with the trauma all the time because they also perpetrated it. They become animals. They, uh, they become cannibals who attack other human beings uh, like zombies. And now they have to live with that fear, that guilt, that aggression, that, that anxiety which has gripped them forever. And the feeling of being gripped, the feeling of this claustrophobic condition all happening inside one small room, uh, not being able to talk, not being able to perform, not being able to act out. This entire claustrophobia becomes interesting over here and that almost consumes the characters over here. So this uh, all-consuming claustrophobia of partition, the numbness of partition, the coldness of partition, the cannibalistic quality of partition, they all become uh, interestingly plain and foregrounded. Uh, it's very, very uh, sexualized narrative, which is called meat. So the trauma becomes a distributive phenomenon, trauma becomes a contagious phenomenon, uh, trauma becomes an embodied phenomenon, trauma becomes a corporeal phenomenon uh, uh, in, uh, in this particular story, which engulfs everyone, it paralyzes everyone, uh, the perpetrator, the consumer, uh, the, the, the listener of the story, everyone gets equally uh, paralyzed by the particular trauma. So as you can see, it's a very complex story, it's a very, very dark story about partition, but also a very authentic story about what, you know, what must have happened during that time where faceless people attack other faceless people and completely mindlessly there's no reason why uh, they should attack those people but this became a contagious disease it spread like um, a fear it spread like contagion right uh, and that became uh, the big thing that became that aggression that violence became a big thing and that became the norm uh, the entire city became a violent metropolis a violent cannibalistic city where everyone eats everyone else in a very wolf-like way
So uh, do read the story uh, in detail. So we just touched upon it theoretically and uh, with the historical backdrop of partition. It's a very violent story. It's a very graphic story with very explicit details. But it's also a pointer uh, to the uh, cannibalistic quality about partition, the cannibalistic quality about violence of partition, where what gets partitioned is not just land masses, but you know, your sane self from your insane self, your normal self from your trauma traumatized self. Uh, you know, that, and you live with a partition forever. You become a partitioned self, you become a partitioned body, you become a partitioned limb, as it were. And that phantom fear of partition engulfs you all the time. It never lets you go, it never leaves you, it's, it seizes you and it consumes you in a very, very cannibalistic way. So that concludes the story. I do read it and we'll continue discussing it in the subsequent lectures as well. But from this point, we move on to the next text, which will begin in the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.